The Ontario Diagnostic Days on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Grain Farmers of Ontario Agris Co-op BSF Canada Bear and DeKalb Corteva and Pioneer Great Lakes Grain Mazex The Mosaic Company Pride Seeds and Syngenta Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to Ontario Diagnostic Days, Episode 2. Today we're going to focus on cover crops, forage, and wheat management. We'll get started with Omafra Soil Management Specialists Anne Verhollen and Jake Monroe as they visit with farmer Greg Cruikshank at his farm near Drumbo, Ontario. Anne and Jake will share tips for cover crop management as well as some lessons they've learned in 2021. From there, we'll head east to connect with Omafra Forage Specialist, Christine O'Reilly. Christine will tell us how a windrow moisture sampler can contribute to top quality hay. She'll show us how to build the sampler and how to test it in the field. We'll then travel west to Alora, Ontario to talk wheat with Omafra Cereal Specialist, Joanna Fallings and agronomist Russ Barker and Peter Johnson. Our trio will take a close look at what your wheat is telling you including manure management, spread pattern variability, and nutrient deficiencies. Again, CEU credits are also available for diagnostic days. Look for the URL where you can apply for your credits. You'll see that on the screen at various points throughout the episode. We also want to give you an opportunity to engage with our experts. We've added contact information for all our participants today at the end of the episode. And you can also add your comments and your questions in our YouTube conversation as you're watching the episode. We'll get you some answers. Here's episode two. Hi, I'm Jake Monroe. I'm a soil management specialist with Omafra. I'm here with my colleague, Ann Verhollen. We're here just outside uh, Drumbo and we're on a grower's field, Greg Cruikshank. Uh, we're going to be talking about cover crops and cover crop management. Uh, going back and forth a little, bit, a little bit with what we've learned so far this spring in terms of cover crops and, and some lessons moving forward as we, as we get into July and August uh, for post wheat cover crop seeding. So Anne, uh, it's been an interesting spring so far. We've, you know, we, we started off very dry. We're still fairly dry, uh, particularly in this area as well. Um, what are some of the kind of main observations that you've made in terms of cover crops and cover crop management so far? Well, one of the things we've seen is that some of these cover crops uh, were delayed in their control. So really, they didn't control them in the fall. They let rye or multi-mix cover crop go through to the next spring. The other thing we saw, because of the spring that we had and the winter, we've seen a lot of cover crops that overwintered. So we had a lot more cover crop growing in some of these fields than we typically would have. We've seen oats and radish, turnips, kale, things like that, some of these larger multi-mixes with a lot of uh, overwintering cover that was sucking some of that early moisture. And when you figure we didn't get a lot of recharge over the winter, that put us in a planting situation where, well, you saw it yourself, there's places where there's seed going into dry ground because the cover crop took the moisture. Yeah, for sure. And, and I mean, we're fortunate to be able to get both corn and beans seeded in, in good time, you know, yeah. pr pretty much in the, in the first half of May or maybe just into the second half. Uh, and in some cases, Anne, it was, it was it was seed going into moisture, um, but then that moisture actually being being depleted if a cover crop wasn't terminated quickly enough following planting. Yeah, and there's a lot of controversy around, you know, do you plant green? Do you control it in the fall before? I think you and I've talked it through that there's there's a bunch of maybe management practices that would set you up for a little bit more resilience or a bit of an insurance policy depending on what the spring gives us. For sure. And, and I think it comes back to what's your goal out of the cover crop? And I know you've been preaching this for years. Like, wh what's your objective? And, and is it to get a, a high biomass, lots of residue cover crop? Or is it to have soil cover and, you know, help help with the seed bed? And, and 
you know, what have you seen where, maybe in some cases where the goal doesn't exactly align with the way the cover's been managed? Well, there's, there's one field that I've been following because I, I have a time-lapse camera in it, and it's one where the goal of the cover crop was to suck up some manure nitrogen that was applied after wheat. And the goal was definitely uh, achieved. That, that cover crop was about waist high on me, which that's a significant cover crop. Uh, very thick multi-mix with a lot of different species, a lot of brassicas in it, more than I was really expecting and actually more than the grower was expecting. So between the volunteer wheat, the cereal rye that was in that mix, a little bit of oats, and then you, you add in something like a turnip that overwinters, there's, there's a lot of green matter there still come spring. And with the manure, that field was supercharged as far as that cover crop growth. So getting into the spring, we're still looking at a lot of residue and a lot of sucking of, of that moisture. The early herbicide application that this grower did took out most of everything, but it was a bit weak on the brassicas. So those turnips were still coming into flower and coming into seed and causing some, some concern. Right, so that, that question of, of you know, when do you spray off the cover crop? And, and I know that yeah. growers who, are, who, who believe in cover crops and are doing cover crops, there, there certainly, I think, is a tendency in some cases to try to kind of push that cover crop to the limit and to maybe maximize the benefits or the growth. Um, I think we've seen that in some cases that can, that can work out just fine, for sure. Um, but in other cases, you know, maybe the right decision, and again, depending on the goal, um, maybe the goal has already been met, uh, you know, like in your example, that the cover crop took up the nitrogen and, and then maybe an earlier termination in the spring is, is warranted and is maybe going to be the, the best route. Um, I, know I've, I know I've seen that in a number of fields as well this spring that, uh, you know, if it were not for a timely rain, there would not be really, a, a, you know, an adequate stand at all. Um, and again, it, it all comes down to moisture in, in a super dry year like we've had so far. Okay, so when we're talking about cover crops, especially planting after wheat, we got to think about what our goals are, exactly what Jake was talking about. And we have to think about how, what's our soil type and how are we going to manage it come spring? Because this spring, I wouldn't say was a normal spring. Spring 2021 was not our typical spring. Just like 2019, thank heavens, is not our typical spring but almost polar opposites, right? So you need to think about what's your soil type, how much residue can you handle come spring, and what gives you a little bit of flexibility and that you know you're gonna be able to get in there in a timely manner. So that means, do we select a lighter seeding rate? So if we're not grazing it or taking it as forage, back off in the seeding rates. If we're just, or if you're looking for erosion control, you can't really back off in your seeding rates. But back off on the seeding rate because that at least allows a little bit more air movement, a little bit more drying in the spring. Make some choices about whether you're going to take your cover crop out the fall before, whether that's with herbicide or very light tillage. Uh, talking to Greg, he says his, their normal approach is to spray out their cover crop as late in the fall as they possibly yep. can. So they still have those intact roots, so they've got their erosion control and they've still got protection, but they don't have a big growthy cover crop come spring. So rye is a really popular cover crop in Ontario, fairly inexpensive, uh, you know, quite resilient in terms of being able to seed it late in the season. And so it, again, it's made it a popular choice and for, for a lot of growers, mm -hmm. um, but it also does come with some extra challenge in, in that it is an overwintering species. So what are some of the main considerations when you're talking to a grower who's just starting to consider rye uh, that they should keep in mind? Well, usually when we're talking to a grower who's interested in rye, it's probably because they're trying to fit it into as late a seeding possible. So after grain corn or after soybean harvest, those kinds of things, and it's a nice fit there. The challenge with rye though, is that it will grow very quickly under warm, moist conditions in the spring. So we have to be on it. So there's different ways of managing it. The standard recommendation around rye, uh, in advance of corn especially, is to control it with, with herbicide at least two weeks in advance. That will keep it fairly small given our typical corn planting time. And essentially we've got very little residue left. We don't have a lot of competition for nutrients at that point, not a lot of tie up. When you start to go into more of a plant green scenario like you see from behind us, uh, there's going to be a lot more competition. And, and to be fair to Greg, this was an oops on, and he admits that, right? 
So this got sprayed a week after planting in a dry year. So a lot of competition for moisture and nutrients. And you can see that it's really held the corn back. So we know this is not going, this is not something we want to do. Uh, if you are thinking about planting green, usually with plant green, we're, we're going to spray just immediately before or right immediately after planting corn. Uh, plant green also works a whole lot better, I think, if you're in a strip-till situation where you've had all that rye residue moved well away from the corn plant. Uh, it's not for everybody. There's also different ways of managing the rye, so we can think about the rate of rye that we're using. Right, yeah, Jake? for sure. I mean, I think, I think in this in this case, unless your goal is to is to really be aggressive in, in suppressing weeds, you know, less is more in terms of in terms of a seeding rate for rye the, the previous fall. Uh, you know, having that seeding rate be something, I don't know, 40, 50 pounds, some growers even go going lower than that. That just means you're, you know, you're not gonna have as thick of a stand that's preventing, you know, if we have a wet fall, it's kind of the Goldilocks. You, if we have a wet spring, I should say, you don't have as thick of a stand that's keeping the soil from drying out. Um, but then if you do have a drier spring, again, it's less aggressive. It's not going to dry the soil out as fast as if you've got a very, very thick stand. So, But wait a minute. Everybody tells me that if I've got this growing rye in the springtime, it's going to dry the soil out so I can get on there sooner. Yeah. You think that's really working for us? Yeah. So, And I've seen it, I've seen it both ways, and I've actually got data to show both ways. And in, a, in the extremely wet spring of 2019, rye at my site with a very, very thick stand of rye actually kept the soil a bit wetter than, than a bare soil because there was, as you recall, very little sunshine uh, that spring and no opportunity for the wind to help help dry out that soil. And uh, and all even with all that transpiration, it was still keeping it wet. Now in a dry spring, it goes, it goes the other way. Um, and so again, that's where I think it comes in. You provide yourself a little bit more flexibility in your management um, by having a more modest stand of rye there. Or killing it ahead of time. That's that's the greatest amount of, I think of flexibility it, for sure is to get that rye killed when it's when it's done its job, protected the soil over the winter time, and again, like you've already mentioned, not not going to cause any issues with nitrogen tie up or with d disease transfer into the corn. And uh, you know, it's it's done in a way, and, and you can get your get your corn planted into relatively bare soil. And truthfully, every spring is a new learning event, and with rye, you keep on learning. For sure, for sure. And it, it's, uh, it's a very versatile cover crop, but it's one that requires you to, like you mentioned, to be on it in the spring. So, um, you know, not a, not a beginner cover crop situation in this sense of, of planting green into it, but a you know, great cover crop to, to have for a specific purpose and, uh, and to protect your soil that way. Well, and if you want to do it as a beginner, if you're just starting with rye, then that is the time where you target it to be sprayed out at least two weeks before corn planting. So you're dealing with rye that's only about this big. For sure. And that would be an easy start. For sure. And then build your comfort as you go through it with some different weather scenarios. Yeah, absolutely. And and we should touch briefly on, on soybeans and, and soybeans into rye are, speaking of something that's a little bit more of a, a little bit of a safer bet, you know, again, you could spray that rye off a couple of weeks ahead of soybeans as well. Um, soybeans, as we all know, are, you know, they're a little bit less, less fussy and a little bit more adaptable to different situations. And so, um, you know, planting green into, into, soy, into, into rye with soybeans can be, can be a, a lower risk scenario than for corn. And uh, there are certainly growers doing it quite successfully. And again, the key there is, you know, start with a more modest, uh, you know, stand of rye. Uh, it's just going to give you more more flexibility. And it's still amazing the amount of weed suppression you'll get, even from a very modest amount of cereal rye. And that sure. is true. Here we are talking about winter or cereal rye, not rye grass. Yeah, important distinction. And yet we've certainly found that it's really good on, on uh, helping to keep Canada flea bane smaller, good on lamb's quarters and pigweed and, and some of the common weeds that we experience. So just to wrap things up on rye, you know, what would you say, Anne, is you know, one of the big takeaways for you in terms of rye management for growers? Make sure you understand what your goal is and adjust your termination timing to fit your goal. And, and on my end, I'd say if, if you are at the stage where you, you feel like you're going to get more benefit to leave that rye, plant into it, make sure you're getting it killed either, like you said, just before or just after planting. I know there's growers pushing the envelope on later, but that's just not a comfortable spot to be, in my opinion. 
and you know make sure that you're getting that seed down to moisture especially in a dry spring like that so if, if you need more more down pressure uh, you know make sure you're checking and getting that seed down well into moisture because rye can can in some cases take it away but great cover crop just needs to be well managed in the springtime yep Okay, we're back here for Diagnostic Days. We're at Greg Crookshanks Farm in Brant County. Uh, you know, and the interesting thing about Greg's place here is he's doing all kinds of different stuff with cover crops, innovative stuff. He's, he's got some cattle, and he's, so he's doing some grazing. He's taking some, some uh, cover crops for feed and, uh, and, and also doing strip tilling combination with that system. Um, one type of cover crop in particular, and you've got it in your hand, that, uh, that Greg's using in some of his mixes is, is that should turnips and other brassicas. Um, so I want to have a little bit of conversation with you about what you've seen this year on a number of topics, but let's start first with, with talking about brassicas. Okay, so brassicas, that's like the radishes, the turnips, the kale, things like that. And yeah, Greg's using them in his mix after, after wheat and it, I think it works great where he's grazing it. Uh, I'm not as convinced that turnips and kale really fit when we're taking that cover crop and harvesting it for a forage and, and making it into baleage. Depends on the amount that's there. Uh, if there's a lot, it could really affect the moisture levels that you've got in that. It's, it can be kind of slimy. It fits really well when you've got manure. And in this case, Greg's got a fair bit of chicken manure that he brings in, so it's, it's feeding these these uh, brassicas. They're heavy nitrogen feeders, so they work best if there's a lot of residual nitrogen. They also should be avoided though if you've got a rotation that includes anything like canola, uh, just because it's all the same family, so just to keep your rotation clear. The one caution about these is that you can have a percentage of hard seed. And I've seen this this year where there was a processing pea field that had essentially an outbreak of radish in it and the suggestion is that it was probably hard seed that developed right. over a, a period of years probably it was a bit of a weed escape um, that's a concern the other concern we can have with some of these is the turnips so greg's turnips here are not very large they're fairly small about you know the size of a small egg so they weren't huge to be getting through with the planter. I know there's a lot of complaints that come out of the U.S. about avoiding turnips in your, your mix if you're going to be seeding corn into it, just because some planters really struggle with that. And I saw some evidence of that with another field where it was strip tilled. The strip tiller cut and moved a lot of that out of the way, so it wasn't a big problem. But because that field had seen a lot of hog manure, oh man, those, rat those, those turnips were huge. They were like... I don't know, bigger than baseballs. And I got to stop you there, Ann, because I thought turnips died over winter. Like, what, what did you yeah. see this, this spring? Yeah, what we saw this spring is, no, they didn't die. That was, that was a big challenge. So the turnips didn't die, kale doesn't die. And truthfully, a lot of turnip and kale don't die anyways. The bigger surprise for some people was radish didn't die. Right, right. So those are all concerns. Those, some of those brassicas, they tend to be, we, we include them because they're a little more cold tolerant which when we have a mild winter or we get a lot of snow right off the bat and we never get really bare soil with cold temperatures, we're gonna see some more overwintering. So you gotta be prepared to deal with that in the springtime. Yeah, and you can even see it there on that one, on that one turnip stem. It's still a little bit green here and look at how tall the corn is. So just a little bit of a, bit of a slower kill on Definitely on a slower kill. And depending on what your herbicide choices are, these, once they get to that stage, can be quite challenging to kill. And what I saw with some of the other fields where they were, they were coming into flower and starting to set seed. And that's a problem because then we have seed there for the next year. And we know with brassicas, it's, it's in that mustard family. Mustard seeds live a long time in the soil. Yeah, and, and I've, seen, I've seen the same thing this spring. So uh, for sure, it's, it's probably not an isolated incident. A lot of overwintering and maybe some unexpected, um, you know, turnip and other brassicas to manage. So speaking of, speaking of, of weeds, um, there, there has been a lot of conversation over the last number of years about uh, uh, different cover crop options and, and annual ryegrass is one that I know has gotten a lot more attention recently because of resistance issues and, and issues managing it. So what have you seen so far this year with annual ryegrass? 
So we've been cautioning about annual ryegrass for a while. And if you ask Mike Cobra, he'd tell you that just you don't plant it. And I think we're getting very close to that point already. What I've seen is a lot of escapes. And so escapes in a rotation where it's a corn, soybean, wheat rotation, and then suddenly you've got a lot of uh, annual ryegrass coming up in the wheat. It might have been seeded there as an interseeding in the corn, which the reason we choose to do it then is because it is a little bit more herbicide resistant, so it'll take the herbicides into corn. Uh, that's a two-edged sword, right? Because it's a little more herbicide resistant in the corn means it's a lot more herbicide resistant when we're trying to kill it. So the thing with annual ryegrass is that you need to be on top of it and we have to seriously work at killing it if you're gonna use it. That said, the only place I think it really works is as an interseeding in corn, and I think there are other options. So in the interests of maintaining uh, um, cleaner fields, probably best to avoid annual ryegrass. And that is the feedback I'm getting from a number of experienced growers who've been using it as an interseeding. And you know, fields that saw it as an interseeding five years ago seem to have some outbreaks, and they're getting to be pretty hard to control. And I know there's a number of growers who've told me flat out they'll never plant it again. Yeah, good, good to know for anybody who might have been thinking about, uh, about annual ryegrass. Despite all the benefits of the root system, you, you, you can't have a cover crop becoming a weed issue. And uh, so m moving on, uh, I know you've had some other kind of oddball kind of issues so far this season and related to escapes of cover crops and cover crops you know, having kind of lived beyond serving their purpose and becoming weeds. So what are some of those situations? Yeah, so this has been the year of the challenge, the cover crop challenge, shall we say, that cover crops may have had escapes in previous years that just weren't, weren't caught. So again, coming back to that processing pea field where there's radish, cover crop radish in it, and the radish is coming into flower and setting pods that are about the same size as the processing pea pods. That becomes a challenge when you set a pea combine in there and you're trying to separate the two or when it gets to the, the factory. That becomes a real issue. But it's, it's still coming back to there, was a, uh, there, there were radishes that managed to go to seed at some point in the previous four or five years. And those offspring of that radish weren't caught it still comes back to scouting. Same thing with even the escapes with annual ryegrass. Cover crops are not like, you know, the simple button. It, it, it does take a little bit more management, which means with some of these cover crops, whether it's radish that can have that hard seed and set seed in the fall in a big multi-mix and you might not notice it, that annual ryegrass that you seeded mistakenly four or five years ago, you need to be on the lookout for it. And after you've sprayed it, you need to be going back about a month later to make sure it really did die because it's kind of like a possum. It'll roll over, it'll look really brown. And then scarily enough, there'll be these little green shoots coming out underneath and it'll be 30 days later. So you think you've got it and it can set seed still at that point. The other one is if you've got buckwheat in your multi-mix, buckwheat sets seed very quickly. And while it's not that hard to control, you do need to think about it and know that it's there to manage it. So really what it comes down to is cover crops require management and you should be scouting to make sure that if you thought they were dead, they really are dead. So that we're not dealing with cover crops as weeds later on. Hi, I'm Christine O'Reilly, Forage and Grazing Specialist with Omafra. Moisture content can have a huge effect on forage quality. After we cut, one of the next big decisions that we make that, that really can affect forage quality is the moisture content at which we put up the crop. So when you're making dry hay, you're trying to get that moisture content down low enough that it's not going to mold, it's not going to heat and denature your proteins and, and burn up some sugar, and we also don't want to risk spontaneous combustion. So most methods of forage testing take too long to be really practical for this infield decision of when we're putting up that forage. Um, labs often take at least a couple of days to get the results back to you, so obviously moisture will have changed in the field. But even a coster tester or a microwave, um, it takes half an hour to an hour 
to get that one sample dry. And to really get a good sense of what's going on in the field, there's a lot of variability. We need more than one sample. So we've got multiple samples. It's gonna take a few hours. And by that time, the moisture content has changed. So the tool that we have on a lot of farms that does provide an instant reading is a bale moisture probe. The challenge with that though, is that because it's relying on electrical conductivity to estimate how much water's in that forage, it has to have the hay packed tightly around it in order to work. So obviously a bale probe on its own can't measure loose forage like this. In 2002, Ron Thamert of the University of Idaho came up with a design for a windrow moisture sampler. The idea is that it will allow a bale probe like this to test the moisture in loose forage like this. What's intriguing about it is that it should be very easy to build on farm. So that's what I'm gonna do today. I'm gonna build one of these things and then we're gonna bring it to the field and try it out. One quick disclaimer, this is not a tutorial. This is an experiment. I've never built one of these before. I don't know how this is gonna go. So you get to come along on this adventure. All right, so first step is to cut a three foot length of inch and a quarter PVC pipe. So the PVC pipe is supposed to act like the plunger in a baler. It's what's gonna let us compact that sample, press it all down into the, the moisture sampling tube. But to make sure that it doesn't get all plugged up with hay, we've gotta cap those ends. So I'm using some solvent cement and inch and a quarter PVC pipe, or sorry, PVC caps, just to close off that pipe and, and make sure that it's actually going to work like a plunger. But once we've got both ends on there, that's the plunger done. So the next step is to cut a two foot length of two inch ABS. This is going to be the chamber in the baler, essentially. Whoops, watch your elbow, O'Reilly. Uh, safety first in the shop, everybody. Um, yeah, but what I was saying, so this two foot length of two inch ABS, it's gonna be the chamber in the baler. So it's the space that we're packing that hay into. And the idea is we wanna get it dense enough that a bale moisture probe can actually check the moisture of that loose hay accurately. So just like with the plunger, we have a few component parts that need to be cemented to that ABS pipe. So the first one is a two inch coupling. Just stick that on the end there. And then I put in a two inch clean out adapter because we need some way to get this hay back out of our sampler chamber once we're done checking the moisture on that loose hay. So we'll get that fitted into the coupling. And the last piece then is the plug. So you can see there's no cement on the plug. We need that so we can actually push the hay back out. And that's it. That is the Windrow Moisture Sampler as designed by Ron Thamer. So let's go test it out. Okay, so according to the instructions, now that we've got our Windrow Moisture Sampler, we're supposed to flip over the swath and find the wettest hay to see whether or not it's ready to bale. So, I'll get underneath here. Grab some of the stuff from the bottom and start to fill it. Got to get that all stuffed in to make the plunger go. So the idea with grabbing the wettest stuff is that it'll help us time whether or not this is actually ready to bale. If we just pull from the top, that's the driest. So that's not gonna give us a good read on whether this is actually ready. And the challenge though is if you grab really big handfuls, they don't wanna pack in the tube. How fast we can fill this, I'm not sure.
All right, that's pretty full. So time to check it with the bail probe. And the trick is to try to get it going straight down the pipe so we don't hit the walls. Yeah, this is just reading low. This is pretty dry, actually. 9.4. 9.8. So yeah, this, uh, this would be ready to bail. So let's see if we can get it back out. Unscrew the cap at the base. This is why we did not cement that in place. And... See if this will work like a post pounder. Woo! <laughs> yep, that worked. All right, one sample done and a few more to go across the field just to see how even this is, see if it's ready to bail. I think the principle is good, yeah. But um, it might be easier thinking about it if you make it shorter, a little wider, and fill it maybe two or three times instead of uh, trying to stuff the whole pipe. Uh, the other thing you might want to do, um, when you get a plunger, make him a quarter inch smaller than that. Okay, so what did we learn? First of all, Thamer's design works. We were able to measure the moisture content of dry hay without starting a baler, which is awesome. Um, as you heard Fritz mention, it, it takes time to load, it takes time to unload. So there may be some modifications we can make that will speed up that process. So I'm gonna head back to the shop. I'm gonna try building some modified versions of that windrow moisture sampler, and I will see you at second cut. Welcome to another great Diagnostic Day session. Joanna Falling, Cereal Specialist here with Amafra, and today we're gonna to be talking about what is your wheat telling you? We've got Russ Barker, agronomist and sales rep with Pioneer, and we're gonna talk about manure and wheat. Then we've got Peter Johnson, agronomist with Real Agriculture, and we're gonna be talking about some variability in spread pattern. And to finish things off, we're gonna talk about some of the nutrient deficiencies we're seeing this year. So let's kick it off with Russ to talk about manure. So Russ is the guy that coined the term, wheat shows everything. And when we talk about wheat shows everything, we're talking about compaction, tile drainage, poor nitrogen spread pattern, manure application. And manure, this is something growers are trying to get more out of. They want to get more of their manure and they're using it more in wheat. But what are some of the things or some of the challenges that we're seeing this year, Russ? Well, you're 100% right. Manure is such a valuable, particularly liquid manure in, in wheat production is such a valuable resource. It makes sense to use it. The limitations that we've seen from all our drone work over wheat, uh, and everybody knows this, the spreads lick manure, even though you can drag line it and you can be more uniform than you can with a tanker, you still have issues where you turn and swing those spreader booms. Instead of having 3,000 gallons per acre, you swing and you'll have seven or 8,000 gallons per acre and that area there and swings around you'll have 2,000 over there and then of course wheat shows you as they say it wears its emotions on its sleeve <laughs> and it tells you when it's happy it tells you when it's sad it tells you when it's totally depressed and uh, so on so we've seen that quite a bit so what should we do or what can we do better to get that uniform application should we put a hundred percent of our nitrogen needs with manure or should we be using two-thirds a third what sorts of things should we be doing to improve our, our manure use in wheat? Well, because you can't put it on in any degree of perfect uniformity, like you can with a well set up fertilizer commercial rig, um, you literally can't depend on 100% of your N coming from manure. Um, and, and the exact percentage is kind of up to, up to you and the grower depends quite a bit on whether you're talking swine manure, whether you're talking dairy manure, of course, you have different nitrogen contents as well as other things. Uh, and I tend to think that somewhere in the half to two thirds, if you yep. can hit it there, is, is maybe the sweet spot, um, maybe 75%, somewhere in that range, and then balance it up with commercial nitrogen, either through precision applications, or at least smooth that, uh, that out for a little bit more uniform growth pattern. So Russ, we're seeing this in wheat, 
But why don't we see this, you know, ununiform application show up in corn? Why aren't Chris and Ben talking about this in corn as much? You know, that's a good question because we know what happens in corn just as it happens in wheat. <laughs> there is no difference. We still make those uh, variable applications. First of all, a corn root system is different. We plant corn in generally wider rows, 15s, 20s, 30 inch rows. The roots have more of a, an umbrella. They get out, they reach the end more so than, than wheat does. The other thing is that the nitrogen timing on corn is different. Mm -hmm. It's later in the season. Wheat needs that in early. And so all those little subtle differences will manifest themselves in the wheat crop. Just like little subtle differences in, in equipment setup, equipment maintenance. You can have on, on tankers with splash plates that can be wore. If you use a lot of sand dairy manure, mm -hmm. you can eventually give those things a dish and they will not spread manure, liquid manure, as uniformly as they do when they're brand new. So maintenance is important, equipment maintenance is important. Uh, technology, in terms of guidance, it helps a lot. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a variable product and it's a very big challenge to spread it perfectly uniformly. It's just so, the way it is. But so, it's a great resource. It's an You've got to use resource. it. You can't beat manure. <laughs> yeah, and so it just really goes to show the uniform application is key with winter wheat. And we see that with nu other nutrients as well, whether it's dry or liquid. And that's what Russ and Peter are going to get into next. So Russ, wheat is a, I love wheat, right? But man, you talk about nitrogen and wheat just shows everything. And as you say, like it's because of the narrow row widths and all those things, but man, as much as I love wheat, nitrogen can really go wrong. Oh, it's your best friend in wheat and it's your worst enemy. If you don't get that, that rate close to where you need it for good standability, less lodging, and we all know this year what the challenge that, that, that whole thing has been, especially with manures. Yeah, well, but not just manure, right? Because I, my wheat went down, oh my gosh, and, and it's a lodging year, right? It's a, and so, so I need a better agronomist. If you're available, Russ, I need a better agronomist to keep that wheat standing. But, but are there systems that, that will do a better job than others? I'm sort of a, like, I hate dry fertilizer spreaders. What do you say? I say this that the new dry spreader technology, as long as you keep one product in the, in the, in the bin, you can get along respectably. However, I don't think you can still, given that, you still can't totally rely on a dry spreader. I think you still cannot beat the uniformity that you get with liquid sprayer, boom, need them bar, whichever system you wanna talk about, you just can't beat that uniformity. Yeah, and this year you can ever see that uniformity in the liquids, right? Because, boy, where it's overlapped, right? Straight line right down the field and she is just done, boom, flat, right? Yep. The other, but the other, the downside of liquid is that what happens if I drive a little wide? Well, yeah, you got to miss. Yeah, and the what's... Uh, the uh, other thing with liquid is that uh, if your wheat gets a little tall, and you're coming in with a later split, what happens? So you get burn, yeah. right? And, and burn can be tremendous. I had burn on my own wheat this year. And, and so from that standpoint, uh, can you show us some drone pictures, Russ? Like that, that's really cool. Uh, and in that drone picture, the big question is, we've got wheat that's burnt, we've got wheat that's not burnt. What's the yield outcome? And we don't know that today on July 2nd. We don't know that today. The interesting thing, I've flown that field after it's headed, after it's flowered. You can't see those differences in the heading. So who knows what the yield impact's going to be. Yeah. It, it's going to be, I think it's going to be some, but you, we, it may not be that much. Yep. And, and as long as we don't burn the flag leaf, then we think yep. that's okay. Uh, or, uh, but I still hate burning it. So liquids, we worry about burn. Dry, we worry about non-uniform spread patterns. And by the way, like in this picture, you can see where we have non-uniform dry spreader. And it was the first application only. And it's one of, it's a, a fancy new technology spreader, but it wasn't calibrated 
for the ammonium sulfate. It was still calibrated for some other product, didn't get calibrated. So the best technology still has to have good calibration, right? And good operators. Yeah. Somebody, in, somebody in the cab operating thing that, that has, has a brain. Yeah. Quite often, quite often, the mistakes of machinery are, are a result of the dummy in the seat. The nut behind the wheel, exactly. as Ken, Nick would, would, Ken Nixon would say, the nut behind the wheel is the problem most of the time. Mm -hmm. So by the way, if, you don't, if you're using a Wilmar spreader, nothing against Wilmar spreaders, they've done a decent job for a lot, but they simply can't do the right job in wheat because wheat shows everything, right? It's emotional, just like you. Yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about wheat showing things, one of the things that we see year after year, even though we never stop talking about it, Peter's talked about it for 30 years, and we're seeing it here in front of us, and that's phosphorus. Phosphorus shows up every year. Why, Peter? Why are we still talking about this? Yeah, I don't know. 30 years, you make me seem old, Joanna. Dog, got it. But you're right. Ever since I started this game. And we're here in the long-term P&K trials at Alora, And this wheat is, is lacking phosphorus. And once again, what do you see, Joanna? We're seeing the shortening of the crop. We're seeing a delay in maturity. We don't have that nice, beautiful canopy closure early on. Phosphorus is critical if you are serious about wheat. If you want to grow wheat, that phosphorus needs to be going down with the seed. It's so important for early root development and growth and critical for winter survival. But we're still not putting it on every acre. Yeah, I don't understand that. I really don't. It, and by the way, the other thing you didn't mention is uniformity. So we get the uniformity. So when we put that fusarium fungicide on, we actually can do it at a much more accurate timing right yes here we get these these doggone late tillers down in the crop i can't pull them out because that it's a plot but but this phosphorus thing and it but you know make sure you use phosphorus with the wheat seed but it's not just phosphorus right joanna so what about sulfur that's like tell me about sulfur sulfur you know it still seems to be a bit of a challenge we still we know it's an issue on sandy soils low organic matter soils but it seems that when the wheat crop needs it even on our good textured soils and even where we have history of manure applications sulfur is an issue and why that is it's cold the crop demands it early and at that time we're just not getting that soil mineralization so sulfur still is an issue year after year if you know you get a response get that sulfur on there if you haven't seen a response it's still worthwhile playing around with it and seeing what kind of response you get especially in a cold wet year yeah. but sulfur isn't the only thing we're seeing what else are we talking about this year peter yeah so sulfur by the way just just to finish Thanks. up quickly because with sulfur we still get questions can i put it on in the fall uh, and when we put it on in the fall, the problem is that, it, that over the winter, any sulfate that the plant can pick up, it tends to get leached out of the soil profile. And in the spring, any elemental sulfur that we might have applied that didn't get leached out has to be changed to the sulfate form. And for corn, that works perfectly because corn needs its sulfur way later. Wheat's demand is so early that really spring sulfate applications are essential if you're going to get that that response and like we see that time and again and the, the other quick note is man with sulfur we think we have to up the rate now a little bit because with, yeah. what about with big yield wheat where you're are we absolutely at, right there's you know there's some agronomists like that like to use this 10 to 1 ratio so if you're putting down 150 pounds of nitrogen you should be putting at least 15 pounds of sulfur down you know we traditionally saw that 10 pounds being the most economic rate but where we're really pushing our nitrogen rates we are seeing a need to also push our sulfur rate so if you're pushing those rates up your sulfur rates and you're absolutely right elemental sulfur is great for alfalfa crops not so much for cereals so what else are we talking about this year peter yeah so the other thing that we talk about every year in wheat and in soybeans yes. of course is manganese and wheat goes manganese deficient we saw tons of it this yes. year because dry spring cold spring and that's also part of the sulfur story when we get those cold springs that the release is just that much slower but with manganese if it's dry a uh, dry soils manganese just 
isn't available. Under wet soil conditions, it, it uh, reduces. It's a long story. We don't need to get into the technicalities <laughs> of it. But man, you can have manganese deficiency like crazy. Get a two inch rain, it'll disappear, right? It's amazing. And another telltale sign for manganese deficiency is compaction. If you've got dark tracks in the field, that is your perfect telltale sign for manganese. That compaction makes that manganese a little bit more available to the plants. And so those plants will look much darker green than the rest of the field. Yeah, because in the compaction strips, it's wet. So, because we hammered that soil, right? Absolutely. absolutely. So we're also seeing the need for two applications in some instances this year. Why is that, Peter? Well, Why are we having to put more on? Because manganese doesn't move in the plant. So we fix it and then the plant grows because we fixed it and that manganese can't move up in the plant. Plus, lots of times we don't put enough on and if the soil is deficient, it's really hard to put enough on foliar. So yeah, two applications, 10 days apart. I've even been in sandy soil situations, much more manganese prone to deficiency uh, where we had to do three applications for crying out loud. Whoa. Yep, but, 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 but if you do it, or uh, maybe I should say it the other way, if you don't do it, it costs you big time. We've seen 25, 30 bushel yield losses where we don't fix manganese or yes. where we don't fix sulfur. And of course, you know, uh, phosphorus, you just know you're gonna lose yield. Absolutely. So you ha there you have it. Wheat shows you everything. Big thank you to Peter and Russ for joining us today and looking forward to seeing some big wheat yields this year. So there you have it. We hope you enjoyed episode two of Ontario Diagnostic Days. Be sure to come back and see us on August 17th when we'll have a live episode. We'll talk about 2021 insects and disease with uh, Omafra's Tracy Bowdy and Albert Tenuta. We'll see you then. The Ontario Diagnostic Days on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Grain Farmers of Ontario Agris Co-op BSF Canada Bear and Decal, Corteva and Pioneer Great Lakes Grain Mazex The Mosaic Company Pride Seeds and Syngenta.